Hi, everyone. I'm Hugo Mendez. I'm a member of the UNC Newman community, and I'm also a professor at UNC Chapel Hill. And in this, my YouTube lecture debut, Friar Tim has asked me, tasked me really, to introduce you to the Gospel of Mark. So this is our lecture today, Introducing Mark, here in January 2021. So this year, Roman Catholics will hear readings from Mark during Mass. You might know this. We read uh, in our lectionary at Mass, right, different Gospels in different years. There's year A, year B, year C. So in year A, we read um, at the Gospel selections from the Gospel of Matthew. In year B, we predominantly read the Gospel of Mark. Uh, and in year C, we read the Gospel of Luke. Well, this is a year B, and we have the privilege of engaging the Gospel of Mark. My task today is to introduce you to this ancient Christian text um, that forms part of our scripture. Um, my hope is that for those of you who experience this text in Mass, when you know Friar Tim or Friar Bill read the Gospel, that you get to engage this text in new ways coming out of this lecture, that this lecture helps you make connections, see things that you might not have otherwise seen. For those of you in Newman Small Faith Groups, I hope that this lecture helps deepen your discussions in your groups, uh, helps you, again, make connections, synthesize things, um, and go, go much deeper into this text than you might have otherwise. I want this lecture to be a resource for you in 2021 as we engage this particular gospel. Okay, so before we introduce Mark, it's worth introducing myself. I'm Hugo, Dr. Mendez, whatever works. I'm an assistant professor of religious studies here at UNC Chapel Hill. This is my third year on the faculty. Uh, I came to UNC via Yale as a postdoc and uh, I did my PhD at the University of Georgia. Uh, I specifically am a scholar of the New Testament and early Christianity. And more precisely, I specialize in early gospels and in gospel writing. I am fascinated as a scholar with how early Christians thought about and wrote about the life of Jesus. In the first three centuries, Christians wrote dozens of texts discussing the miracles, the teachings of Jesus, the death and resurrection of Jesus. Um, four of them are contained in our Bible today, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but dozens of others were written, a lot of these apocryphal gospels, Thomas, Peter, these sorts of works. I'm interested in what inspired so many Christians to want to tell stories of Jesus, how they told the stories they did. Uh, more specifically, I specialize in the Gospel of John, and some Newman students took my seminar on the Gospel of John last semester. This semester, I'm teaching the Gospel of Mark, uh, and I'm teaching, right, uh, you know, a group of students in, in that particular text. And so it's kind of ideal then that I would take something of what I do in the classroom with respect to this Gospel and share it with everyone at the Newman community. Um, I want to note here, by the way, I, I've loved being a part of the Newman community. I'm actually Byzantine Catholic. I'm not Roman Catholic, um, but I, I take sacraments here and I participate in the life of Newman because there's something so incredibly special about the way that our um, you know, parish student center bridges the university and our faith, connects the intellectual life of what we do at UNC to spirituality, liturgy, practice. It's the most deeply moving thing for me as a professor to take communion beside my students, beside other faculty. It's something that, that just gets me every single weekend. By the way, if you do see me at Newman on any particular weekend, please stop me and say hello. And I'd love to get to know more of you. Um, and kind of returning back to this slide, I've included my email. Uh, if you have any questions on this lecture, on the gospel, and more broadly on the New Testament, please do email me hmendez at email.unc.edu. I'm really happy to engage you all. Okay, so let's get into Mark. 
And, and let me just start with the headline. Mark is amazing. This is an absolutely fantastic work. And, and part of what I hope to do here today is get you passionate about it to make my passion for this text somewhat infectious here. Uh, it's, it's an absolutely historic, absolutely watershed text. But, and here's a key but, it's not a widely read text. In fact, it's probably the least popular gospel in the New Testament. So if you, if you line up the four gospels in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, by any metric, Mark is the one that people pay attention to the least in literature, in art, in theology, in spirituality, in daily reading. Mark kind of is the runt of the pack which is unusual, it, it, you know, it's, it's, well, for a variety of reasons we'll talk about. Um, but one key reason why Mark has tended to get left behind is simply the fact that Mark is missing some of the things that people love in other gospels. So for instance, we just came off the Christmas season and you've loved gospels about, uh, you know, gospel readings, right, about Jesus being born, the wise men, the star of Bethlehem, the shepherds. Um, these are stories that are enormously important to us this time of year. None of those stories appear in the Gospel of Mark. There are no stories about Jesus' birth in this text. There are no stories about his childhood in this text. This text abruptly begins when Jesus is age 30, getting baptized by John the Baptist. In fact, there are fewer stories and parables in this text, period. Uh, this is a shorter text overall. It's only about 15,000 words long, which, I mean, it, you know, isn't a lot. It's like a long journal article or maybe an article and a half. This is a very easy text, in fact, to read in one sitting as the shortest gospel. Um, so, right, this is kind of one of the reasons why Mark doesn't end up on people's landscapes or, or, you know, attention or imagination. If you're looking for the stories of the baby Jesus, they're not there. If you're looking for the Good Samaritan parable, the famous parables of Jesus, you won't find many of them there. Uh, some of the greatest miracles of Jesus, the raising of Lazarus, the turning water into wine, they're not in Mark. Mark is bare bones. It's small. It's condensed. And in that respect, it's different from the others. Um, my job here then, really, in introducing you to the Gospel of Mark, is to help you maybe engage a text that has escaped your attention for years. It's probably really worth it that we study this text in particular together. I want you to see why, even in its brevity, this text is actually breathtakingly fantastic. Um, so, yeah. So let's get into the background of Mark. Let, let's talk a little bit about what this text is and where it comes from. Uh, so this is, we think, the oldest gospel. Scholars regard Mark as the oldest of the four canonical gospels. If you take Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, this one was the first one that was written. And we also think as scholars that as the oldest gospel, it was also the gospel that inspired all other gospels. Its publication, point number two, was a watershed event. It inspired future works like Matthew and Luke. It was the big bang of gospels. So, so think about it this way. I mentioned that Mark is really short, right? Really compact, compact and condensed. Um, we think that what happened uh, is that other authors like Matthew and Luke picked up this text and saw what this text was. It's sort of an account of Jesus' life that across a book. And it was an idea that just kind of made them all click and say, yeah, this is a great idea, except Mark doesn't talk about the birth of Jesus. We need to put stories of the birth of Jesus in here. Mark doesn't talk about this miracle or this parable. It's time to put these things in it. And so what we find is that Matthew and Luke are essentially extended versions of Mark. They took over large parts of Mark and then filled it out with more stories of the life of Jesus. The fun of Mark though, 
uh, is that it stands at the beginning of this process. But you can see how that process would mean that in the end, it ends up being the least popular one, right? It becomes kind of the beta version, the rough draft of what Matthew and Luke are doing to the point where later Christians kind of look at it and think, well, we'd rather have these fuller, richer, more complete gospels. And Mark sticks around in our Bible, but kind of in the corner of, yeah, the beta version, the rough draft. Okay. Um, but it's more than a rough draft. It is an incredibly interesting work in its own right, beyond simply its impact on other works. So who's the genius behind this text? Who wrote this text? Well, the reality is we don't know for certain as scholars. The gospel itself doesn't tell us. It doesn't name its author. It's anonymous. We presume as scholars that the author is probably male because in the ancient world, authors were overwhelmingly male. The reason is if you're gonna write a book, you need an extremely high level of literacy in the ancient world that would have taken a lot of wealth to acquire and that would have been asymmetrically male um, in terms of you know, the way that privilege was distributed. So um, yeah, most people in the ancient world were just not literate at this level, period. Uh, some were literate to a very small extent, right? Maybe they could write their own name um, the way that my three-year-old son can write his own name. Maybe they could read the occasional sign. Some of them had a maybe, you know, a basic education that could let them go a little farther. Maybe they can like write a short letter. But to write a full book like Mark takes education, takes years of education. So yeah, we think this author is someone who probably is male, probably has certain kind of privilege in his background that allows him to be able to write this way. But here's the trick. Um, the book is anonymous, but there are early traditions that attempt to tell us who the author is. And those early traditions attribute the book to a particular figure, Mark, who appears to have been a disciple of Peter, who of course was a disciple of Jesus. So if you read the letter of 1 Peter, um, Peter writes, your sister church sends you greetings and so does my son Mark. He refers to Mark as his spiritual son. He's a disciple of Peter's. Well, when you get to the second century and some of these writings written later, uh, you'll have, for instance, an early church father, Irenaeus, who says Mark, the disciple and interpreter of Peter, did also hand down to us in writing what had been preached by Peter. As a lot of these early accounts go, when Peter died, Mark, his disciple, decided to gather together everything he could remember that Peter talked about with Jesus and put it together into a book. And that's the gospel we have today. Now, as scholars, we're always interested in these debates. Um, you know, this is an open question for us about how we weigh these traditions, how we work with it. Our Catholic faith allows lots of different kinds of ways of approaching this issue. But suffice it to say, um, the book is anonymous, but early traditions very strongly say that this was written by Mark, a disciple of Peter's. Uh, and that's why we call it Mark. And that's why I'll refer to this particular author as Mark. Okay. Now, what else do we know about the author? Well, we know that the author spoke and wrote in Greek. So you know how if you have someone who has been born and raised natively in another you know, culture and speaks a different language natively, uh, you can tell subtle signs potentially in their writing. Um, so for instance, you know, my dad, uh, I, I come from a Hispanic Latino background. Um, my dad's English in writing, in spoken English is always laced with some sort of Spanish and his turns of phrase, his grammatical expressions. For those of you who do linguistics, you might know this as second language interference. Okay, our author has none of that. He's writing in Greek and he's writing in Greek that shows no traces of another language background. Apparently he's a native speaker of Greek, which by the way, makes him different from Jesus, who, if you might remember from the gospels, is a native speaker of Aramaic, a language that's very closely related to Hebrew. 
Um, so this is an author who is telling the story of Jesus, but in a different language than what Jesus spoke. He's giving you what Jesus said in translation, essentially. Now, I mentioned also that this author is educated, but I want to nuance, nuance that a little bit. The author was educated enough to write a book, which, as I mentioned, would have taken a lot of years to be able to develop that level of skill. But his Greek, his written Greek, is not that sophisticated. He's not, if you will, a great writer of Greek. He's an adequate writer of Greek. And one of the ways that we tell this as scholars is when we count up how many verses begin with the word and. So let me, let me give you an example of this. Let's look at chapter one of Mark. And let me just take a little segment, verses 16 through 22. And just follow along as I read this. Okay. And passing along the Sea of Galilee, Jesus sees Simon and Simon's brother, Andrew. And Jesus said to them, come along after me and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately abandoning the nets, they followed him. And proceeding a little further, he sees James, the son of Zebedee and his brother, John. And they were in their boats, mending the nets. And immediately he called them. And leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired hands, they went away after him. And they enter into Capernaum. And immediately entering the synagogue, he taught. And they were astonished at his hearing. And, and, and. If you're reading this in English, if someone, if a student turned this into me as an essay, I would not give it a high grade uh, because it's not sophisticated English. Well, in the same way, uh, if you read it in its original Greek, it's not sophisticated Greek. It's a bad high school essay. Um, it doesn't have the subordinate clauses, the rich, long sentences and stylistic flourishes that we see in really, really strong Greek, like for instance, the Greek of Luke. This is an author who had an education, a good education to be able to write a book of this length, but who also was not the best writer. He's a very adequate writer. He's trying his hardest. And this is, I think, something really important to understand, right? As Christians, when we approach scripture, we can often see it as something almost kind of floating above our heads because, right, it's divine. It's a revelation from God. But remember that scripture is incarnational, just like everything else in the Christian faith. It's divine, but it's also deeply human. God created the Bible in front of us through very imperfect human instruments, right? Um, he used the imperfections of an author, the inadequacies of an author, um, all present there when they authored their text. And so we can see these subtle differences between this text. Even though this is a sacred text for us, it comes from shakier hands than Luke. Um, and that's just part of the beautiful tapestry of Christian faith. The fact that God uses imperfect people to accomplish incredible things like launch a literary genre of telling stories of Jesus, inspire later gospels, all from a figure who might not have been the best writer on the block, but did his best. Okay, so that's something of what we get from the ands in Mark. Now, another note in terms of who's, you know, if we talk about who wrote this, we need to talk about who's reading this, right? Who is this text addressed to? And we actually have a very clear sense of this as scholars. We believe that the Gospel of Mark was written to a predominantly Gentile or non-Jewish audience. So Jesus was Jewish. His disciples, like Peter, were Jewish. But our author seems to be writing this text for people who aren't Jewish. In fact, people quite a bit like ourselves, right? Today, 99 plus percent of Christians are non-Jewish. Um, and so in a beautiful way, this text kind of shows us how the gospel was being taught to the earliest uh, examples of Gentiles in Christianity. So how do we know that the gospel is written to a non-Jewish audience? Well, there's one passage that makes this very clear to us as scholars. So it's in Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. And it's a place where the author feels he has to explain Jewish practices to his audience. He actually has to stop to explain what's going on. Okay, so let me just read this for a second. It says, 
Now, when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled or unclean hands, that is, without washing their hands. And then notice what the author does. He puts parentheses here. He stops mid-story to tell his readers something he feels they have to know. Okay, so here's what they have to know. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands. If you're, if you're confused at this point in the story about why washing hands is important, the author is saying, it's because all the Jews, they, they have these traditions where you have to wash your hands. They don't eat anything from the market unless they wash. Um, there are also many other traditions that they observe. He's pointing at the Jews, but as if they're a different group of people. Um, they do the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. In other words, our author feels in this parentheses that his reader is going to be lost if he doesn't explain to them what Jews do. In other words, his readers are not Jewish, who would already be assumed to have this knowledge. They're non-Jews. He's writing to non-Jews, to Gentiles which by the way, makes him different from other gospel writers. We think for instance, that the gospel of Matthew was probably written to a predominantly Jewish audience. And one of the ways that we actually also kind of look at that as scholars is Matthew takes over this story from Mark. He borrows this story from Mark, except he takes out the parentheses. He doesn't need to explain this part to his audience, we think, because he's writing to a Jewish audience. So if you look at the parallel story in Matthew, you'll see the difference. Lots of fun scholarly hacking the gospels. Okay, let's keep moving. And let's talk about the message of Mark because this is the real core of what I wanna to communicate today. So what is the message? Why did the author write his text? Well, the book identifies its central message early on in the very first verse. It identifies its message as the good news of Jesus Christ. So if you read the very first verse of this text, 1-1, one, one, it says the beginning of the gospel or good news, the word gospel just means good news, good tidings, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. When you walk into the text, the text tells you this is the beginning of the good news. That's what this book is about. It, that's what this book is. It's the good news of Jesus Christ. So, you know, you might stop here and you might say, yeah, but that kind of raises more questions than answers. Specifically, what is the good news of Jesus Christ? Or what part of Jesus Christ is the good news? Or, or what does that mean? Well, keep reading and the gospel clarifies it for you. In chapter one, verse nine, we read that when Jesus came into Galilee, he was preaching the good news of God, the gospel, and saying, and, and so here we get to hear what the gospel is. Here's the good news, quote, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. This is the good news. The time is fulfilled, the time is up, the time has come and the kingdom of God is at hand. So what is this? What is this kingdom of God? What is this verse talking about? Well, to understand this verse, you have to go back earlier into scripture. You have to go back to the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, the words of the prophets um, in, in, right, uh, you know, that predate Christianity, that predate Jesus uh, in his earthly life. So um, the kingdom of God is an idea that comes to us from the Old Testament. And particularly from the book of Daniel, most especially. So in Daniel chapter two, verse 44, we read this prediction from the prophet Daniel. And in the days of those kingdoms, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall this kingdom be left to another people. It shall crush all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. So what it's saying is at the end of time, God is going to set up his own kingdom. He's going to, all the kingdoms of the world that have ever existed, Babylon and Persia and Greece, he's going to crush these kingdoms. He's going to establish his own kingdom. This kingdom is going to be an eternal kingdom. So what's the message of Mark? The message of Mark is the time is fulfilled. You've been waiting for this kingdom to come. It's here. 
The kingdom of God that you've been waiting for is at hand. It's coming. This is what Jesus is proclaiming. This is what the gospel of Mark is specifically about. <clears throat> so, what else is the kingdom of God about? Well, so when you go back to the Old Testament, we read that the kingdom of God, uh, especially in Daniel, right, in, in Daniel in particular, the kingdom of God seems to be associated. It comes when a celestial being called the Son of Man comes and is given power over the earth. So the coming of the kingdom of God seems to be very much about the coming of a particular figure, the Son of Man. So in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, we read, I saw one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. To him was given dominion and glory and kingship that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away, and his kingship is one that shall never be destroyed. In other words, Daniel's saying that when this kingdom is coming, it's coming through this figure of the Son of Man. God gives the kingdom to the Son of Man to rule, this eternal kingdom of God that he's going to set up. And this prophecy is one that Mark is clearly aware of and channels. So that Jesus in Mark chapter 13 says, the sun will be darkened, the stars will be falling from the sky. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory, just like in Daniel. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect. In other words, the entire point of the Gospel of Mark is the kingdom of God is coming. And by the way, this figure, this Son of Man, is now here and coming. Um, this is central to the message of Mark. Now, this message of the kingdom of God, I, I want you to also realize another facet of it. It's a controversial message. So think about where we are in the ancient world. Jesus was born in the Roman Empire, under the Roman Empire. At, at, in his lifetime, the Jews had been conquered by the Romans. And so when you claim that God is going to set up a new kingdom that's going to crush all existing kingdoms, needless to say, this is a somewhat treasonous, challenging statement, right? You're essentially making a provocative challenge to the authority of the Roman Empire. And that, by the way, I think is very much at the heart of Mark. Mark's message is not a safe message. It's a bold message to a world that it views as having fallen to corruption, to sin. It's proclaiming that God is about to tear down this entire edifice, including the Roman Empire. And it's positioning the kingdom of God as an antithesis to the Roman Empire. Now, by the way, this I think has something to do with why the gospel calls um, its message good news, the good news. It's because the Roman Empire itself and the Roman imperial cult, the worship of emperors as gods and heroes, very much viewed the coming of the Roman Empire as good news. So, um, and this is the quote that we're about to look at here. So let me give you a little more background on this. So the Roman Empire, had conquered most parts of the Mediterranean through the first century BC and finished its conquests by the first century of the Common Era. And in that period of time, you know, people after people group, ethnicity after ethnicity fell to the Roman Empire. And some of these ethnicities tried to ingratiate themselves to their new conquerors and overlords. And so in Asia, uh, in modern day Turkey, we know that in several communities, uh, essentially a, a push began to try to ingratiate these communities to the emperor by declaring that the birth of the emperor, the birthday of Caesar Augustus, 
should be the first day of the year. And we have these inscriptions, they're called the pre end calendar inscriptions in slightly different versions, in which the people of Asia um, officially declare that they will commemorate the birthday of Caesar Augustus, September 23rd, as the beginning of their new year. Um, by the way, quite a bit like the way modern Christians um, commemorate the birth of Jesus as the beginning of their year, right? We begin the liturgical year with Advent and Christmas, not coincidentally, I think, that there may be a sort of implicit challenge to some of these ideas of organizing time around the memory of these emperors. Well, so when you read these inscriptions that, you know, these uh, ancient people in Asia, Minor, Turkey, um, you know, uh, put out there, uh, notice the language here. I want you to, you know, pay close attention. So it says, these people are celebrating Caesar. They say, Providence has sent to us and to those after us alike a savior. Notice the word savior, which is the word that Christians apply to Jesus a savior who ends war, who orders all things, Caesar, by appearing surpass the hopes of all. For the world, the birthday of the God, Caesar, was the beginning of the good news, which were because of him. In other words, Christianity is emerging in this context. This is done a few years before Jesus's birth, a few decades you know, or so before the Gospel of Mark is written. Jesus, Christianity is born into a world where you have people in the Roman Empire praising Caesar Augustus as a savior, as God, worshiping him, viewing his birthday as the beginning of their calendar. And Christians in this context and, and are, are viewing this competitively. Um, and these same people in Asia Minor, right, are also saying that the birthday of Caesar Augustus is the beginning of good news to the world, the end of war, etc. And Christians are looking at this as well. And so what I want you to see in the Gospel of Mark is that the Gospel of Mark is implicitly a challenge to this. It's proclaiming a different savior, a different God, who rules a different kingdom, who has come bringing different good news. The Roman Empire isn't going to solve your war problem. The Roman Empire isn't going to bring peace and, and prosperity. Only ultimately God can do that. And he does so through the true savior, the true God, Jesus Christ, who is ultimately revealed in the gospel of Mark. So this good news that the gospel proclaims, I think is in a certain sense in tension with the good news of the world around it. Um, the good news that would supposedly have the Roman empire be the salvation of people, et cetera. It makes you look at the kingdom of God as salvation. Okay, so that's a complicated concept, um, but I, I hope you see that kind of competitive angle in there, um, which in maybe more implicitly than explicit ways will come out in this text. But there's a special paradox at the heart of this gospel. And this is a paradox that you can't miss when you read the gospel of Mark. That paradox is that although there's a coming kingdom that will conquer the world and Jesus is the son of man will lead and rule that kingdom. The paradox of Mark is this kingdom doesn't come with glory and power originally. The son of man doesn't come with glory and power originally. The kingdom starts in a very small way. It starts when the son of man comes to be arrested, humiliated, tortured, and crucified. And this is not a message, by the way, that Jews reading the book of Daniel, reading the Old Testament would have understood. So Judaism traditionally has never anticipated a Messiah who is killed. Um, again, remember those prophecies in the Old Testament that we just read talk about how when the kingdom of God comes, it's gonna crush every other kingdom. When the son of man comes, he receives glory and kingship. That's not Jesus, exactly, not yet. 
Jesus begins by coming to earth humbly to be crucified, and only later will he come in glory, right? That's the, the message that we hear at the Mass, right? Christ has come, um, and Christ is coming again in glory. He came the first time in humiliation and suffering to be crucified. He will come again in glory. This is a very distinctively Christian idea. It's not a concept that ancient Jews had. And we know this from, not least, the biblical text. Uh, so like in Mark chapter 8, verse 32, Jesus, it says, began to teach his disciples that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, the text says, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Peter's like, no, that's not the way it works. But Peter is a Jew in the first century. He has no concept that the kingdom of God is going to begin with a tortured, humiliated, crucified Messiah. In 1 Corinthians 1.23, Paul says, we proclaim Christ crucified a stumbling block to the Jews. Jews did not believe that this is the way it was supposed to work. But the message of the Gospel of Mark is the kingdom of God is coming. And it's coming from a figure who was crucified suffered, humiliated, tortured. That's where it's getting its start. That's the radical message, the paradox at the center of Mark. The kingdom of God is coming where you don't expect it. And this is part of the reason why, by the way, Mark has the shape that it does. One of the things you'll notice when you read Mark is that like a third up to a half of the book is basically focused on Jesus' death. It is, as a you know, early 20th century German scholar, Martin Kaler said, a passion narrative with an extended introduction. You know, half the book just basically brings you up to the last week of Jesus' life very quickly. And then half the book is focused on just that last week and Jesus' arrest, his suffering, his crucifixion. Everything about Mark is trying to bring you to the cross to understand the paradox that the kingdom of God is coming in glory, but from a figure who suffered and died in the worst and most humiliating way possible, stripped naked on a cross. And that paradox, you also have to read competitively with the good news, if you will, of the Roman imperial world and the cult of Caesar as God and savior. There's an enormous contrast between the way that the world looks at, in the first century, the Roman Empire and greets it as this conquering glorious power and the message of Christianity that says, no, there's an even greater kingdom and an even greater power and it's found in this figure. That paradox continues, by the way, in other respects in the gospel. One of the ways that the paradox continues is that Jesus in his teachings in Mark wants his followers to understand that glory cannot come without suffering and sacrifice. Mark 8, 34, Jesus says, if anyone wants to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. The message of the coming kingdom in Mark is a message of suffering and death for those who want to be a part of this kingdom, of martyrdom, of the cross. That is the very disturbing undertone beneath Mark. And if you're going to understand Mark, you have to understand both pieces of it. The kingdom of God is coming in glory. It's coming through suffering, sacrifice, and death. Now, Jesus helps his disciples gradually understand this paradox, and he does it through something you're very familiar with from gospel readings at Mass. Parables. Jesus tells stories about the natural world, little examples and illustrations, but he uses these illustrations to develop his ideas of the kingdom of God. Point number two, most parables focus on that paradox in Mark. 
the idea that the kingdom of God is going to emerge from unusual, seemingly insignificant beginnings. So let's just take one parable. Let me just give you a good example. The mustard seed, right? This is a parable you've probably heard at mass many times before, but I want you to set it in the full tapestry of what Mark is about. Jesus says, so it starts here, right? He also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable will we use for it? Well, what is the kingdom of God like? He says, it's like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of seeds. It's insignificant. It doesn't strike you as anything. But when it is sown, it grows up and it becomes the greatest of shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. The kingdom of God starts small, Jesus says, and then it grows and it becomes something large. And the message here that Jesus tries to communicate through this parable, through many other parables is, the kingdom of God is going to begin where you don't expect it, in a form you don't see it, in a seemingly insignificant form. It's going to begin with a man who died the death of a criminal in the first century, who was crucified, tortured. This isn't the person you would expect would take over the world at the end of time and bring the kingdom of God. But this is precisely the figure who is going to do this. When you read the parables in the gospel, you'll find that many of them are making this move. Look for them as you go through the gospel. And this, by the way, explains something of another aspect of the parables. There's an insider-outsider contrast where the gospel constantly kind of makes the note that not everyone can wrap their minds around these parables and around the paradox at their heart. So like in chapter four, verse 11 of Mark, Jesus says um, to his disciples, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything comes in parables. In other words, you're the ones who are going to understand the mustard seed, that small beginning of where the kingdom of God comes from. Everyone else, it's just lost on them. It's just, they're just stories. They're not getting what the message is. So, right, because the message is paradoxical, so paradoxical. So that's the central message of Mark. I, I want you to go through the text and, and try to, you know, kind of capture how that paradox is working. We're not altogether done with it, but one thing that I want to do right now is I want to talk about the literary style of Mark, how it works as a book. So again, in the lectionary, we encounter Mark in individual pieces, right? Like we have little puzzle pieces in front of us. We're given a few verses at a time, and then Father Tim or Father Bill will talk about it. But Mark is a book, and it's meant to be read as a book. You're supposed to read it cover to cover. Um, and by the way, so this is really important here. Um, I'm going to give you a homework assignment uh, here right now. Okay, I'm a professor, right? I can do this. Um, whenever I teach into the New Testament, whenever I teach the Gospels, I always have my students for their very first homework assignment read the Gospel of Mark in one sitting. They have to start at the beginning, and they cannot get up until they've read the whole thing. Like, like you know, bring snacks or something. But there's a reason for this. It's because if you're going to understand the Gospel of Mark, you have to see the entire picture. You have to see not just individual puzzle pieces like at Mass, you have to see the entire portrait, the image ultimately. You need to see the arcs, the major plot arcs. You need to see the character development in the Gospel. That's really crucial. Um, so same thing. I'm going to give this to you as a homework assignment. When you read the gospel, and I want you to read it this week, please promise me you will read the gospel this week before it begins, okay? All right. You're going to read it in one sitting. You're going to start at the beginning. It's not going to take you more than just like an hour or so. Uh, just think of it as like, you know, you're going to be doing a little devotional reading. It's like, you know, kind of a rosary or two or something. But you're just going to meditate on this particular text 
and just read it from beginning to end and see that pattern. What I wanna do here is I want you to kind of point out a few pieces of that pattern that I think are really important and interesting for you um, that will help you sort of get a better grip on the entire gospel. So what are some of the ways that Mark arranges his book as a book, as a work of literature? Mark may not have been a very good uh, you know, Greek writer, as I mentioned, he's fine, uh, he's adequate, he's not sophisticated, but here's what he is. He is a great storyteller. Even if his Greek writing is not sophisticated, his storytelling is sophisticated. In fact, I would venture to say he's better at storytelling than Matthew, Luke, and John. He has a very unique skill at this. And, and let me, let's get into that a little bit. So Mark, like any good literary author, for one thing, constantly weaves in sustained motifs. As you're gonna move through the story, you're gonna notice, and this is why you have to read it in one sitting because you'll never get it from week to week at mass. You gotta read it through. Mark keeps hitting on the same points repetitively. The most important of these key points, one of the key points that rises to the top is something that we as scholars call the messianic secret. Okay, the messianic secret. Throughout the Gospel of Mark, and it will become blatantly obvious when you read the text in one sitting, Jesus constantly tells people to hide what they know about his supernatural power and identity. He doesn't want people to tell other people he's the Messiah. He wants them to keep that to themselves. So for instance, in Mark chapter eight, verses 27 to 30, it says, Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? I just kind of asked them on the road. And they answered him, John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others say you're, you're one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answers, you are the Messiah. And Jesus sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. It's a weird reaction that, that Peter figures out who Jesus is, is able to realize Jesus is the Messiah. And then immediately Jesus stops him to say, you don't tell anyone that. Why is Jesus keeping his identity a secret in this text? This is something that is you know, worth exploring as you go through the text. Um, because it's, again, it's gonna come up again and again and again. Here's another example of it. Let's go a little further. Um, so this is actually, um, I'm sorry, I, I put the wrong verse here. This is the beginning of Mark chapter nine. I think it's like nine. You'll probably see it between verses two and nine. So I apologize for the wrong thing. It says here, six days later, this is the Mount of Transfiguration, the Transfiguration scene, right? Uh, the one that's depicted on this icon right in front of me. Okay. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. Jesus' clothes become dazzling white. He's shining brighter than they can imagine. And then the vision ends. And as they were coming down the mountain, the story says, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Jesus appears in all of his supernatural glory and he immediately tells the disciples, shh, you don't tell anyone about this until I've risen from the dead. Why doesn't he want them to tell people about this? What is, what is it about this secret and this secretive nature? Why the secret? Well, we think that the issue is that Jesus is trying in Mark to protect the proper understanding of who the Messiah is. So remember again, Jesus' contemporaries had their own, as the gospel would have it, mistaken preconceptions about the Messiah. They thought the Messiah was going to be this glorious figure who never suffered and died. Jesus for, for Jesus, the secret of the kingdom of God, the secret of the son of man has to come and suffer and be killed. And the kingdom of God is gonna have these tiny humble beginnings. 
in this crucifixion and you know terrible death that can only be understood until the, after the death happens um so he doesn't want anyone to go about proclaiming that he's the messiah because it would be fundamentally misunderstanding who he is he's not what people think a messiah is he's not coming to win your battles and declare peace right now he's coming to do something very important to die on the cross to begin a much more gradual coming of the kingdom of god and by the way this ends up being woven back in the story in one of the most interesting ways um again i put the wrong text i apologize and i'm like way too deep in this lecture to fix the text but it comes out in the story of the transfiguration um, I'm doing this over winter break, and so clearly all of my professor polish is gone right now. Okay, but um, in the story of the of you know the transfiguration, remember that Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up a mountain and reveals his glory to them. Well, later on in the gospel, you have the Garden of Gethsemane scene, and it says when they had sung a hymn, they went up to the Mount of Olives. Notice it's another mountain, just like the Mount of Transfiguration. Now we have the Mount of Olives. And once again, he takes Peter, James, and John with him, just like he did at the Transfiguration, now on the Mount of Olives. But where there he appeared in glory, now he appears in suffering and humiliation. It says that he began to be distressed and agitated, and he said to them, I am deeply grieved even to death. This is crucial. Jesus shows his disciples his glory on one mountain, his inner three, Peter, James, and John. On the other mountain, he shows them what is necessary to unlock that glory. He shows them the distress, the suffering, the sacrifice, the rejection. That's the center. So the gospel creates this paradox, and it sort of inscribes it across two balanced stories on two different mountains with the same three disciples. This is part of the storytelling of Mark, the way he weaves motifs, the way he connects passages and has them allude to one another. You want to see these two scenes side by side because this is the paradox at the heart of the gospel. But Mark uses other creative techniques to help his readers uh, and to draw them in, right? For one, he chooses to tell his story not in a strictly chronological way, but in kind of a thematically relevant way. If we talk about the storyboarding of Mark, Mark isn't doing a simple Jesus did this, then he did this, then the next day he did this, and then he did that the next week. Instead, what Mark does is he puts stories in interesting combinations that aren't necessarily chronological. So for instance, what do I mean? First, Mark likes to group similar stories together. So as you read through Mark, here's one of the things you're going to notice in mass, uh, in your own private study, in your small faith groups. Um, when Mark does a controversy story, a story of Jesus challenging the Pharisees or the Pharisees challenging Jesus. He doesn't do just one. He puts five of them in a row, clumps them all together. These might have happened on different months, uh, different weeks, but he puts them all back to back. He wants you to look at these together. He groups them thematically. You keep going in the gospel, and then Jesus will start doing parables. But he doesn't just do like one parable here, necessarily one parable there. He clumps them together. Mark clumps them together. So you'll get a lot of parables and teachings on parables in a row. And then later on the gospel, you'll have more teachings, and they'll be clumped together. Uh, another thing, right, later on in the gospel, Jesus will have more confrontations with the Pharisees and Sadducees. Again, these things kind of repeat, but you won't just get one. You'll get a whole bunch of them clumped together. Mark likes this. He wants to train you on thinking about one story in relation to other stories. He wants you to see how Jesus builds his message through parable after parable. He wants you to look at the mustard seed parable next to the sower and his seed and to trace the common thread that binds them all together. Another thing he does, and this is, you know, the bullet point four or numbered point four here, 
sometimes Mark groups together stories that he sees a thematic relationship between. In other words, they may not be the same genre, they may not all be parables, but Mark sees a connection between them and that's why he puts them back to back. So here's an example of this. Here's a great example of this. So there is a very weird story you're going to encounter in Mark. You will find it only in Mark. It's the only gospel that contains this story. It's the miracle that didn't take. So here's the story. Jesus goes ahead and encounters this individual who wants a particular healing done. He wants to see, he's blind. And at the beginning of the story, Jesus attempts to heal him from his blindness. He touches him and he says to the man, what do you see? And then this is the second part. And the man says, I see trees walking. He's, it's like he can't see it properly, uh, right? Something's wrong. And so then Jesus touches him again. He attempts the healing again and says, now what do you see? And the man can see clearly, he's fine. Oh, the man can see, oh, there are people. Oh, this is what the world looks like, etc. He sees it all again. And then Jesus tells him, tell no one what I just did. Again, remember the, the secrecy, the messianic secret. Now, this is a really unusual miracle if you think about it. I mean, we're used to Jesus being all powerful, right? As Catholics, we confess that Jesus is God from God, light from light, true God from true God. Why, if Jesus is God, does he try it once and it seems to fail and then he has to try it again? Why does the story have Jesus do it twice? It's weird. It's a riddle. And it's something that you're not going to understand until you read the story that comes immediately after it. So think about this again. Mark likes to group stories together that have a relationship to one another. So if you don't understand one story, I'm going to tell you, look at the stories beside it. Look at the story before it or look at the story after it. And that will help you unlock the meaning. So if you look at the next story, it's the story of the who do people say that I am. So Jesus says to his disciples, who do people say that I am? And the disciples say, ah, you, you're maybe John the Baptist or Elijah or one of the prophets. It's like they see that he's someone special, but they don't see the whole reality. It, they see trees walking. Their, their vision isn't yet adjusted. So then Jesus tries again, just as he tried the healing again. He says to the disciples again, who do you say that I am? And now Peter sees clearly. He says, you are the Messiah. I see it now. And Jesus commands him to secrecy. These are stories back to back. Notice again, this one ends in verse 26. This one starts in verse 27. Mark has grouped these stories because what he wants you to see is that Jesus is working slowly with his disciples. It's taking a while. Jesus has to keep trying to get them to see the whole truth of who he is. Just as he's having to heal this blind man in several stages. The healing of the blind man in several stages is a metaphor for the arc the disciples are having to go through as they slowly try to understand that Jesus is the Messiah. And then most importantly, and this gets to the paradox at the center of Mark, what it means to be the Messiah, suffering, death, crucifixion. Mark groups stories like this together. He wants you to draw connections. Okay. Um, there are other kinds of ways that Mark does this, by the way. He likes to sandwich similar uh, stories. To, so he like, Mark likes to sandwich stories within other stories. So if you're reading a story, sometimes you'll see another little story stuck in the middle in a weird way. Here's a great example of this. In chapter 11, there's this story where Jesus is walking um, around Jerusalem uh, and outside the city, and he sees a fig tree. And the tree doesn't have any fruit on it. And Jesus curses the fig tree for not having fruit. Now, this is a weird story, right? Let, let, let's go with again. Mark, Mark has no fear of weird stories. Um, and the story you know, why would Jesus care to curse a plant? Like, you know, this poor plant, I mean, you know, it's not its 
little fault that it doesn't have fruit, why would Jesus go to all the trouble to curse it? Well, then you read the next verses. Jesus goes into the temple and he overturns the tables in the temple. Um, he, right, the money changers who are fleecing people, he's releasing the doves, he's doing all these things. He's causing a scene to demonstrate that God is going to judge all of the sorts of things that are happening at the temple. And he's going to be destroying this place, um, right, when the kingdom comes. And then that story ends. And then we're back to the fig tree. Jesus leaves the city with his disciples. And as disciples are walking on the road, they notice the tree that Jesus just cursed has died. What is that about? Well, what it's about is precisely the story sandwiched in the middle. Jesus is condemning the people who are rejecting him, these you know, religious leaders, et cetera, um, who have not produced the fruit, the, the everything that they're supposed to do. They haven't brought forth here metaphorically the good fruits of righteousness in their life. And so Jesus curses a fig tree to represent what he's about to do to these figures. Then you get the story when he does it to these figures and displays what the judgment is going to be on them. And then as they're leaving that scene, his disciples see the fig tree has died. It's, it's an image that shows what will happen to these religious leaders. They will be condemned. They will suffer and die ultimately when the kingdom of God comes because they have been unrighteous, because they have taken advantage of people, because they have used their power for evil, etc. The meaning of the story is found tucked away in a little story in between. This is what makes Mark such a profound storyteller. He's someone who just knows how to weave an intricate story and to get you to think. And he never says it out loud. He's not someone who tells you how to put the pieces together. That's why when you're in your small faith groups, I want you to work together constructively to try to see what connections you can find between these individual stories. Now, Mark loves one other thing, and this is where I'm going to close this presentation. Mark loves irony. Like any good storyteller, he loves an ironic twist. Okay, so here's the best ironic twist of all. Okay, so you'll remember, um, and I'll set this up for a second, okay. At the end of the Gospel of Mark in chapter 16, you're going to see this, these verses. It'll say early on the first day of the week, three women went to the tomb, right? They see an angel, uh, the tomb is empty. They, they went out, they fled from the tomb for terror and amazement had seized upon them. And verse eight will say, and they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. So the tomb is empty. The women have discovered the tomb empty after Jesus' resurrection. And they go out and they don't say a word. Now today's Bibles have different sorts of, of things potentially appended to them. If you look at the Bible that you might be reading Mark in, you'll notice different endings. The one that you're most likely to see is what we call the longer ending, this one on the right. And it will be numbered verses nine through 20. This is the classical ending uh, for modern Christians. Uh, and basically it'll tell the story of how Jesus appeared to his disciples. But some ancient Bibles don't have this longer ending. Uh, one has a shorter ending, uh, which is only about a verse or so long. Other manuscripts don't have any ending at all. They stop at verse eight. In other words, this up here was the actual end of the text. Now here's the trick with all this. As scholars, we think that the text actually originally ended at verse eight, that when Mark himself, the author, sat down and wrote his text, he stopped at verse eight. Someone later decided to add different endings to his text because they felt it needs a better ending. Again, we think Mark ended his story with the women are running from the tomb saying nothing. That's a weird way to end a gospel. It's kind of a weird cliffhanger. But there's a very real significant reason why we think the gospel ended this way. And it brings us back to the messianic secret. And it brings us back to the paradox at the heart of John. 
Remember that all throughout the text, Jesus has been telling people again and again and again, don't tell anyone about me. Do not tell anyone. Do not tell anyone. Do not tell anyone. Well, read Mark chapter 16. When the women come to the empty tomb, the angel tells them at the empty tomb, go tell his disciples what you have seen. It's the first time in the gospel people are actually told to tell other people what they saw. And what do the women do? They say nothing to anyone for they were afraid. The irony is that at the moment that people are allowed to finally talk about Jesus, the moment where he's risen from the dead, the moment where the whole mystery has now come into the picture of who Jesus was, that he was meant to suffer and die. Now, nobody says a word. They're dumbstruck. They're shocked. They're afraid. Mark ends on this absolutely brilliant, ironic twist where he leaves you thinking, what are you going to do about this? Are you going to tell people? Are you going to understand the entire message that Jesus came to suffer and die? And are you going to be bold enough to proclaim it now that you see the whole message? It's easy to believe in a Messiah who's going to conquer the world. It's harder to do one that's crucified, tortured, etc. Mark builds a beautiful, rich, ironic tapestry of a story. And I want you to enjoy it. Okay, so this is the end of my presentation. I've tried my hardest to do justice to a very complex gospel in lots of pieces. If this seems like a lot and overwhelming in different parts, this is where Father Tim comes in. This is where Father Bill comes in. This is where my particular email comes in. And, and in fact, let me just kind of take that forward for a second. Um, you know, beyond my basic introduction here, if you want to learn more I want you to consider, right, not only kind of engaging this text at mass, consider a good commentary on John. Uh, I would recommend Marianne Beavis's Mark because it's so damn cheap. It's like 30 bucks on Amazon. You actually should really like it. Um, also, if you'd like, consider sitting in my class potentially. I mean, I'm going to have an online, you know, half in person, half remote class. If you're interested in kind of sitting in parts of the class, uh, feel free. Uh, definitely feel free to email me with questions, et cetera. Um, but just to close here, um, this is just a taste of Mark. You've got a lot to go this year. I want you to be intentional. I want you to think deeply about what this text is. I want you to see it as a complete literary work. And I want you to develop the same love affair with Mark that I think animates so many scholars. Um, this is a text that you can read to kids that also keeps the greatest PhDs just kind of working, understanding some of the intricacies of these chapters. I wish you well on that journey. Um, and thank you for sharing this time with me. Have a good one.